This webinar is part of the MSFEA Silicon Valley Channel Program. It's a program that we started about a year ago uh, to connect the LabNet community and to disseminate uh, their research, their professional experience to us. Um, and today, it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Fram Aii, who is going to give us a seminar about digital transformation in the auto and the transportation industry. Um, so, uh, Fram Aii is the president of June Technologies, and in, which is an industry consulting firm. He has over 35 years of experience in the electronics and semiconductor industry, including assignments with Siemens, Qualcomm, and IBM. He holds a BS in electric, uh, BS and an MS in electrical and computer engineering from Clarkson University, and an MBA in international uh, business from the University of Vermont. And uh, currently, he's also an adjunct instructor at Clarkson University and California State University, and holds a patent on RFID and cellular connectivity for the IoT market. Uh, we are very pleased to have you with us today, Fram, and uh, I will give you the floor. I think you can go. Ahead. And, and then we will have a Q&A session afterwards. That sounds great. Thank you very much. And uh, it's my pleasure to be here today to speak to AUB once again. And uh, I look forward to hopefully uh, being able to come back on campus someday physically uh, in the future. I had the opportunity to visit AUB a couple of years ago and uh, still hoping to, to come back. So, There we go. So, June Technologies, uh, as uh, they mentioned, it's a consulting group co founded uh, by my wife and me. Uh, the name June actually comes from my father in law's village, uh, June in the uh, Shoof Mountains. Uh, together, uh, my wife and I have over 65 years of experience in the uh, technology industry. And we've been focused on projects related to digital transformation, 5G and smart connected uh, device strategies. Uh, we've also, by the way, worked with two interns uh, from AUB and uh, hopefully we'll have uh, more in the future as well. So the material you will see today is actually from one of our clients, uh, Siemens. Uh, we've worked with Siemens to develop a course on digital transformation which I'm currently teaching as an adjunct instructor in a graduate engineering and management program at Clarkson University. Uh, it's in upstate New York, and you can see an excerpt from the press release last month here uh, on the slide. So in this course, we're, we're covering digital transformation across eight different industries, uh, but today we're gonna focus on one of those industries, the auto. And I thought I would go through a little bit of an introduction on digital transformation before we start talking about the auto industry. Uh, clearly, companies are seeing the need for digital transformation, not just to survive, but ultimately to thrive in their individual industries. But fortunately, while a lot of companies see the need, not all of them are going about it in the right way. And there have been some very public digital transformation failures in companies like GE and Ford. And if you dig into the details, you will see uh, sort of two key lessons learned. Uh, first, you need strong top to bottom organizational buy-in uh, from executives down into the rank and file. And then second, you need engagement across the organization particularly from operational groups like design, manufacturing, and sales. Digital transformation can't simply be a IT-driven activity. So just before the pandemic, I ran a day and a half session with 20 senior level electronics executives. And there were two items that they highlighted over and over to me. The first was home market pressures have never been greater. Second was getting the market successfully has never been more difficult because of this uh, explosion in complexity. And you know, complexity comes in a lot of different forms. There's market complexity, there's uh, product complexity, organizational complexity, uh, supply chain service, 
um, all these complexities. So the, the promise of digital transformation is uh, it provides an opportunity to take this complexity and somehow turn it around for a competitive advantage. Uh, first, with the insights and data from solutions like uh, comprehensive digital twins, companies can build more flexible connected machines uh, to handle a wider range of products, uh, enabling very quick responses as consumer preferences change, for example. And second, probably uh, even more important, no two companies are the same. So digital solutions allow companies to start their journeys in different places and evolve them over time. Digital transformation, so you know, simple definition, uh, it can be defined as an acceleration of uh, business activities, processes, competencies, and models, right? To fully leverage the changes and opportunities of digital technologies and their impact and doing it in a very strategic and prioritized way. So uh, one thing is digital transformation is much more than just replacing manual processes with, with digital processes. It has to engage people with workflows and digital workflows to promote kind of the full advantage of technology investment across the organization. And uh, one key element, and I always uh, emphasize this with my clients uh, that's often overlooked is digital transformation involves customers. Customers' feedback and responses directly influence the improvements and adaptations. So I mentioned a digital twin, a comprehensive digital twin. So digital twin uh, simply is a virtual imitation of some actual process, product, or service that occurs in the real world. Uh, in other words, it, it takes real world data about a physical object or system, and it provides that as input and produces outputs or predictions or simulations of how that physical object uh, or system will be impacted by those inputs. So in principle, digital twins analyze and monitor data uh, from physically installed sensors, for example, and they can do everything from preventing downtime to helping to develop new opportunities and see what the future will look like, reinforcing digital transformations uh, role and importance. Uh, the digital twin market in and of itself is one of the host hottest and fastest growing areas of digital transformation. And it's strongly enabled by technology. And you can see some of those key technology areas outlined here on the slide. Um, the area of connectivity and the internet of things, uh, all collecting and sharing data. And of course, connectivity right now, strongly enabled by uh, 5G, the next generation cellular technology, uh, which brings the gigabit speeds, uh, real fast response, low latency, and the ability to connect billions of devices. Um, there's also Wi-Fi 6, which is the next generation Wi-Fi technology uh, for home and business environments. Uh, Wi-Fi 6 provides uh, great support and promise for uh, data hundred devices, PCs, tablets, smartphones, uh, even machines, which all have to connect uh, to the internet. Uh, the other big area is compute power. And with compute power, it's not just the incredible amount of compute power, but the uh, flexibility in which you can access this power. So you have cloud computing, for example, which is you know, a very flexible and scalable um, system uh, of using distributed resources uh, for compute power. And they're often located in third party data centers. Uh, you have edge computing, where information processing is located closer to the edge, where things and people both produce and consume that information. And uh, there's an important area that's kind of been born out of the advances in compute technology, which is uh, visual technology. So the whole field of um, virtual reality, augmented reality, and uh, a blend known as mixed reality. And of course, uh, AI technology, artificial intelligence, 
which uh, I like to think of as kind of combining the uh, advancements in both compute and connectivity together to help drive this whole area of machine learning and data analytics. So, uh, digital transformation uh, can be applied in a lot of different areas, but one of the most important areas uh, that uh, people are looking at right now is how to apply it to how products are designed, manufactured, and utilized. So what that's doing is it's changing the way ideas come to life. Uh, today's complex products really require a system of systems approach to design. Uh, it's changing the way products are realized. So you hear a lot of talk about, for example, Industry 4.0, and how it's driving automation and flexibility into the manufacturing process. And finally, it's changing the way products are used and supported, creating new opportunities even in the service realm. Okay, so uh, when we look at the uh, transportation and the transportation revolution, uh, it's requiring the automotive industry to achieve some uh, operational excellence while at the same time dealing with disruptive technologies and business models. And of course, this is uh, to one of my earlier points on the explosion of complexity. So digital transformation actually uh, is needed to address both the transportation revolution and what's happening on that side, as well as the process and process development revolution and, and doing that at the same time. Uh, you see, for example, product realization on here, or integrated product realization. This is the whole concept we'll talk about of bringing together design, simulation, and manufacturing all together. And then uh, you also see on here uh, software and systems engineering. Uh, it's also known as the term MDSE, model-based system engineering. Okay, so one of the most difficult parts of validating autonomous vehicles is the sheer number of scenarios that they can run into. So, you know, how can you be confident that these vehicles are gonna perform safely and comfortably at all times, right? So safety is an obvious prerequisite to enter the market and, and even receive a license to, to operate in the market. But comfort is also required because this is what allows you to gain public acceptance and win your customers. If the vehicles are not uh, comfortable to drive, uh, nobody's gonna be driving it. So comfort can be a key differentiator to build brand reputation for autonomous vehicles. So here you see a real, uh, our first real life example. And I've, I've pulled these examples, by the way, from Siemens. I've, removed uh, the the actual company's names, uh, but I have uh, their permission to, to use these examples. Uh, here was a, a leading supplier of autonomous vehicle systems, uh, both for advanced driver assistance systems, or ADAS, as well as a leader in automated driving development. So their challenge uh, was to prove the safety and comfort of their systems in the limited amount of development time that is available. So they embraced some massive virtual simulation to speed up the development and validation process. Uh, they front loaded their design process with relevant use cases and variations that these algorithms will encounter during their operational lifetime. Uh, they integrated a comprehensive digital twin of the vehicle and its surrounding as part of the complete development. Uh, the simulation platform uh, was developed to be very flexible and open, so it could be easily adapted uh, to existing systems. And uh, they did uh, a lot of virtual testing of various kinds of scenarios in various driving environments and uh, world conditions. So to give you an idea of just how big the validation challenge is with autonomous vehicles, I, I like to use this quote from the CEO of Toyota. Uh, autonomous capabilities are typically measured in levels, um, level zero being the lowest all the way up to level five. Today we're at about a level two, 
with level five considered to be full autonomy. And uh, I should point out that each level going up represents an order of magnitude. So it's not linear. Um, and uh, from the previous level, and so to get to level five, uh, it's estimated that it would take uh, over 14 billion kilometers of, of road testing. And so uh, I mapped that out. That's like 135 million round trips from uh, Beirut to Fredibia. By the way, if, if I mentioned June earlier, because it was on my wife's side, I, I felt obligated to mention uh, where my family's from, which is Fredibia. So that's my plug there. Um, clearly, simulation is needed since uh, that much road testing rate is, is not going to be possible. And uh, use case information, in fact, is so important that you can see Ford recently announced they would uh, share data uh, with other car manufacturers. So you're starting to see some uh, models here that just haven't typically been pre prevalent before. So market share in uh, EV and electronic vehicles uh, is important for the auto industries, uh, both new and established players. Companies need to ensure their electric vehicles are able to alleviate range anxiety by offering you know, maximum drive range and the ability to charge fast. Equally important is to produce these vehicles on a large scale without getting trapped into challenging manufacturing operations. Uh, this is something uh, we see in particular with some of the EV startups who might be lacking all the manufacturing expertise that's been built up by more established players over the decades. So electric vehicles in particular uh, pose challenges uh, with their uh, electrical system. Um, and, and in fact, uh, you know, a, here's another example, right, of a, a leading electric vehicle company. Uh, they had been reevaluating uh, some alternative solutions for a 12 volt electrical system design. In, in particular, it required a strong uh, electrical system uh, configuration control and kind of a well established uh, base within some of their uh, wire harness suppliers. So as production volumes grew, it became important to ensure they had a very robust vehicle specific uh, data exchange with the suppliers of the wire harness for the, uh, for the automobile. Uh, and so a digital solution a tool set, if you will, uh, was needed to enable a real powerful electrical system and software environment that spanned the, the, everything from architecture and system design and integration through to even uh, service documentation uh, and all the way down into the wire harness manufacturing tools. So configuration management uh, is a key uh, goal of digital transformation. It's one of the top three uh, items that executives mention over and over. And it's because we know things are always changing. And so the ability to rapidly handle those changes, whether the changes are coming from what consumers are demanding to something in the manufacturing process, uh, the ability to handle change and handle different configurations uh, is very important. Uh, some key configure considerations in uh, electrification. So um, I've listed a few of them here. Uh, battery design, right? Battery and uh, powertrain design is probably one of the most uh, important and critical uh, elements. And so digital solutions today, right, are offering kind of a whole seamless digital thread from uh, the lith uh, lithium ion uh, cell chemistry evaluation, for example, to cell and pack design to thermal management. And, and how do you integrate this all into the vehicle? Uh, for electric motors, digital solutions uh, can offer adaptable, modern, multidisciplinary 
simulation framework. We'll, we'll talk about that when we get to uh, the process section. Um, uh, and it allows engineers to kind of optimize a whole uh, slew of things associated with motor performance, as well as things like uh, light, noise, and vibration issues. And then on the power electronic side, it means uh, integrating design simulation and testing to address things like reliability issues for power electronics. Uh, you have the whole electrical and electronic architecture. So this is where the MBSE or the model-based system engineering framework uh, comes into play. And it allows engineers to leverage things like generative engineering for system architecture design as well as uh, ECAD, MCAD, uh, electrical CAD and, and mechanical CAD collaboration. We'll talk about that a little bit later as well, which can be very key to addressing uh, EMI and even thermal issues. You have the vehicle attribute optimization. So this is, again, where simulation and, and extensive testing to optimize uh, EV energy and thermal management. Again, also improving things like aerodynamics and uh, meet and exceed the vehicle uh, MDH uh, targets, uh, noise, vibration, and harshness targets. And finally, manufacturing. So EV manufacturing uh, brings in simulations to verify and validate processes uh, before implementing them on the factory floor, which helps to ensure you know, very cost-effective uh, manufacturing. So uh, shared autonomous mobility systems in urban areas, right? They're gonna rely on infrastructure systems for reliable sensing of the environment. Uh, v to X communication uh, between vehicles and the infrastructure is therefore of uh, utmost importance. And uh, both city governments as well as the vehicle industry are relying on digital simulation techniques to prepare for the most effective V to X communication setup and to ensure data security. So here's another uh, customer example from the C-Tran test bed in Singapore, which is a uh, for purpose built facility that tests, validates and certifies autonomous vehicles before they're allowed on the Singapore public road. C-Tran has worked on the concept of mixed reality testing where vehicles will interact with infrastructure and they can be tested uh, by injecting virtual road users like cars and pedestrians and bicycles. This way, uh, the Land and Transport Authorities in Singapore can test realistic but challenging scenarios the vehicle can encounter, do it in a very quick and safe way. And by analyzing the behavior of the vehicle under test, they then can decide whether the vehicle is considered to be safe enough to go on the public street um, uh, through uh, this testing. So in the design of uh, mobility uh, services, um, a lot of design choices have, have to be made, both from an operational uh, as well as a regulatory uh, viewpoint. And these regulations will often change uh, going from city to city or country to country. So simulation software and services provide insight in, into future urban mobility operations that both uh, the industry as well as city governments are using to prepare the entrance of new mobility solutions. Uh, by simulating the communication systems, uh, for example, in cellular, uh, which is a area that uh, I've been involved quite uh, extensively, um, given my experience uh, at Qualcomm, digital tools can provide insights in the impact of the built environment on network coverage, for example, and where investments in infrastructure support will be most effective. Um, also, you have the security of the connection, right, between the vehicle and the infrastructure is of utmost importance. So by testing things like fault injection at different parts of the network stack, the impact on the overall mobility system can be validated and helps provide insights into how such effects uh, can be mitigated. 
Okay, so uh, we talked about the transportation uh, revolution. So let's switch gears now, talk a bit about the development process revolution. And there's many disruptive technologies that can help to better design and produce today's and next generation's uh, automobiles. And, and automakers are taking uh, advantage of the higher compute power in combination with engineering, simulation, and manufacturing uh, applications that embrace new and emerging technologies. Um, this is absolutely necessary, right? When uh, considering uh, the engineering challenges presented by the transportation revolution, right? Things that we looked at like vehicle electrification and autonomous driving. So here's an example uh, from a leading sports car manufacturer. And uh, the results uh, speak for themselves, right? So in design, uh, using digital transformation techniques, the company was able to move seamlessly from styling to feasibility analysis uh, and detailed development. Uh, and they did it, you know, 30% faster than they had ever done before. Uh, with manufacturing planning, they were able to accommodate the 70,000 variants um, their custom approach entailed. So, you know, I talked earlier about configuration management and uh, the importance of being able to handle all these changes. This company had 70,000 variants that they had to handle in a manufacturing environment. Uh, and finally, driving their factory with a MES solution. So, MES is a manufacturing execution system. Um, it basically tries to get rid of all the paper trail and manual processes and try to digitize and, and automate the manufacturing process. And by doing that, the company was able to produce three times more cars than they had ever achieved before. And all of this was done in just 16 months, which was a, a new benchmark for speed in the auto industry. All right, so the, the digital thread for product lifecycle is uh, a key element of the process revolution. Uh, it, uh, it really enables organizations to sort of design anywhere and uh, build anywhere. Um, and I like to think of the digital thread as kind of, you know, weaving together digital twins. So hence, you know, kind of the term digital, digital thread. Uh, in order to uh, re really reshape these existing products and to develop kind of the next generation products, you know, designers are uh, using a combination of uh, traditional technologies, uh, such as feature modeling, uh, and combining them with new technologies like design optimization and convergent mod uh, modeling. Uh, this is a revolution that's, you know, changing design processes uh, and has a big impact on simulation productivity and, and additive manufacturing. So all of this is what we call generative engineering. It's engineering innovation with the ability to at the same time do some uh, intelligent exploration. Uh, the additive design process um, on components and assembly um, are kind of using intelligent concepts for design optimization um, and being embraced by a lot of different manufacturers. Uh, and you can extend this concept using intelligent knowledge on the system level. So this concept of generative engineering even ex extends to, for example, the architectural level that allows you to explore new and different design spaces. And you know, the objective is to realize, uh, again, this concept of a comprehensive digital thread. And it enables front-loading artificial intelligence-driven technology by uh, creating a system which, which can capture knowledge from a large variety of engineering tools, uh, represent that knowledge in a way that it can be treated and reasoned upon by algorithms, AI, and then allowing for autonomous generation of alternatives and continuous validation of the performance to uh, dramatically accelerate the engineering decision process. 
And so uh, similar concepts are equally important, by the way, in manufacturing and cleaning in order to be able to have uh, flexibility to react and balance operations um, as it's hard to predict when things turn off. Uh, by the way, in the past, during downturns, we see auto companies investing to improve in their manufacturing operations. And this is because when things slow down, they have the time to optimize and experiment, something they normally can't do when they're running close to the capacity limit. And so we are seeing this today with the pandemic um, and not just in the auto industries, a number of industries are using the pandemic as an opportunity to accelerate their uh, digital transformation projects. Um, here was the, uh, a slide that I was talking about earlier on the concept of a digital thread. And again, uh, I like to think of a digital thread as sort of weaving together the digital twins, hence the term uh, digital thread. Uh, simulation. Simulation is now a mainstream. I mean, we're, we are truly in an era of uh, simulation driven design where uh, simulation uh, can be used to synthesize and even define the, the physical design rather than you know, simply be used to evaluate uh, and validate the designs that have been completed. Um, the fundamental trend for simulation is that it's becoming you know, better, faster, cheaper, and even, even easier to use. And this has enabled simulation to be used earlier in the design process of automobiles and throughout the engineering development process, uh, from concept to design and uh, performance validation. So uh, let's look at this concept of um, simulation-driven design. It's a, it's a very important element in both the auto industry as well as a lot of other industries. Um, and what it does is it helps kind of further front load simulation in the design cycle. It allows you to shift the development process even further left. So um, with simulation-driven design, it's possible for designers kind of working within their CAD environment to start the design process by actually using simulations first, which helps define what the in initial design uh, shape should be. And then um, after getting the initial shape, the designer can then perform um, a simple qualitative simulation on each uh, design iteration to make sure the you know, the design's on the right track. And this helps designers achieve a more robust product uh, that can be released more quickly than the old way of doing design and then simulation afterwards. Uh, it also helps to free up the simulation team by reducing the amount of time spent on a more routine type analysis and lets them focus in the areas that are more complex. Uh, when we talk about simulation, by the way, it, it can be a lot of different areas. And here are some of the common uh, domain areas uh, in modern products. I'm not going to go through each of them, but uh, one that is extremely important today is thermal. Uh, thermal analysis in particular is an area that's getting more and more attention because remember, as products get more complex, uh, they're also getting smaller at the same time. And, and that can spell disaster for thermal dissipation. So um, I know through my experience at Siemens, uh, in terms of simulation software that we sold, we, we uh, sold much more thermal simulation software than any of the others uh, that you see on here. The design world, uh, you know, we talked about uh, the manufacturing environment, how important it is. The design world is not the only place where, where digital transformation is happening. Uh, the digital twin technology can be used in production um, from the input of raw materials to the output of finished product. Uh, there is a term um, used in the manufacturing process called a production digital twin. And it can be part of an overall smart manufacturing facility uh, and help validate how well a manufacturing process will work by using something called DTSS, Digital Twin Shop Floor. 
Um, and what it does is, is it can simulate uh, before anything goes into production. And the, the digital shop floor can use digital twins of all the manufacturing equipment to further optimize what the production methodology flow will look like. Um, production digital twins enable you to simulate everything from material to manufacturing operation workflows, um, the quality control operations, and you can even optimize production efficiency. Um, it also allows the real production to come online faster because a lot of the code that is used in the simulation process can also be used directly to program the automated equipment that uh, is on the manufacturing line. So today's automotive development process uh, is still very much driven by stage gates and integration points that are you know, defined by the mechanical development process. And with uh, automotive uh, companies, um, they you know, clearly have a lot of um, integrated electrical, electronic development and software development uh, to a certain degree. But quite frankly, the current process landscape um, does not fully satisfy this uh, shift to software and address the demand for uh, continuous development and verification environment at all stages. Uh, I saw a statistic recently uh, from Statista that said uh, in under 10 years, uh, more than 50% of the cost of an automobile will be based on electronics. So you're clearly seeing uh, not just electronic, uh, electrical vehicles or electronic vehicles, but even in um, uh, ICE, right, uh, internal combustion engine, uh, normal uh, vehicles, you're seeing a tremendous electrification happen. So digital solutions are, you know, help this automotive startup uh, actually transform into a pioneer in doing a digital design a development and manufacturing. And, you know, the, the challenges in, for them included how to keep up with the whole continuous innovation of electric vehicle concepts, do it in record time and create and update, uh, constantly update the digital twins, right, for design, development and manufacturing. Um, and the team was aiming for the development of uh, three working prototypes within uh, an extremely small team, right? So the key to their success, they use digital design and development tools to support quick design iterations. Uh, they use, uh, they incorporated something called uh, product lifecycle management software or PLM software. PLM software enabled uh, data connectivity throughout the entire development process. So this allowed the single point of truth, as it's called, for data throughout the process. And they were able to, through that, create these predictive engineering models using a digital simulation suite. And so the result, as you can see, the team was able to digitally design and develop three working prototypes in their first four months. And uh, the company successfully launched the product and they got their first 60 million euro of orders. So engineering uh, complex vehicle systems, right, increasingly uh, enabled by software, uh, you need uh, software kind of methodologies, agile methodologies, and uh, also combine that with a unifying data model for interfaces across the domains. Uh, enabling engineers really to spend their time engineering while the environment ensures that there's the required uh, consistency, traceability, um, and reuse. And so a key realization is establishing a, a process is no longer driven in individual silos. Uh, collaboration is probably one of the, you know, I talked about configuration management being one of the top three, Goals of digital transformation, another top three element is uh, collaboration. Um, and collaboration is really about removing all these individual silos and groups kind of working independently and figuring out ways to have them collaborate better and sooner in the process. Um, 
And so uh, the, um, this mandates, you know, the implementation of something like MBSE or model-based system MBA. So uh, allows an architectural definition and integration, um, including how to uh, integrate it with a kind of a feature-driven software development process. Um, and it obviously with uh, any of these, there's, there's a, a closed loop continuous verification and validation that's required. Um, this is especially important in automotive software engineering because there's a lot of embedded software development that's increasingly critical in the development period. And so having this closed loop feedback um, is important. So let's look at uh, MBSE a little more. Um, the traditional development process is sort of grounds up, right? You design the individual components, sometimes in isolation, and then you bring them all together to form a system. But as these products are becoming more complex, remember the explosion of complexity, oftentimes issues or at least better optimizations are not clearly understood until later in the process. So the idea here is you use complex models, um, often derived from digital twins, to do a tops-down approach. So it can be used to actually architect, design, and optimize the system, all the way down to the lowest component. And so uh, these models are sophisticated enough to attack kind of major um, trade-off issues like, you know, what should be implemented in hardware versus software? Or uh, how will the system perform under different conditions? Even how much will the system cost? Uh, next is design and product engineering. So in the past, the electrical design and mechanical design environments uh, could, for the most part, operate independently. But modern product design is driving something called Big E, Big M, right? Uh, I call Big E complex electronics combined with Big M, which is a challenging mechanical environment. And what this is doing is this is causing the, the siloed design environment to fail. So with electronics now going into an increasing number of products, including automotive, it should be no surprise that two thirds of companies see breaking down these silos as a key part of their product design flow. And so the, the key idea to breaking down these silos is you want to reduce the need for manual intervention um, and aid collaboration and improve the transparency across disciplines. So this includes things like ECAD, electronics design, MCAD, mechanical design, uh, verification and validation. And the goal is to break down the barriers between the teams and disciplines like electronics and mechanical and software to enable concurrent design. So seamlessly integrating electronics into the overall uh, mechanical product development workflow uh, allows you to get to market quicker and uh, with better product. So, uh, you know, some people say data is the new oil and that is uh, probably true. However, the the company that collects the most data does not necessarily win. The company that makes best use of the information to rapidly improve their products and their operations will win. So uh, in contrast, by the way, to the very organized data process flow that happens in the development process, right? We talked about managing it via PLM systems or product lifecycle management. IoT data is typically very unstructured. Um, huge amount of data, and you hear this concept of it being stored in places called data lakes. Um, so in order to take full advantage of the data and the information it contains, it's important to analyze the insights from performance um, at all stages in order to enable the feedback into the upfront process for continuous improvement. So here, another example, uh, this automated vehicle. So the company here uses a variety of digital tools, for design, simulation, and PLM. But then they added an IoT platform that connected uh, sensors in the running vehicle to servers in the cloud so that engineers could get real-time updates on the operation. And then rather than simply provide and use the data for servicing, 
they took full advantage of this kind of flexible open ecosystem and the vehicle began using the data for design changes for future ver versions of the vehicle. So the data was fed into the design digital twin um, uh, for the next generation. So while performance models right, are getting enriched with uh, real world data at all stages, there's really sort of two key activities that need to be done for kind of proper data-driven decision-making um, in the auto industry. Uh, first, you have to completely understand the correlation of the work and process data to release data. And then secondly, have a, a very meaningful digital representation of the product uh, with respect to the, the real product. And these steps allow for collection and analysis of the data, feeding it back into the upfront processes, leveraging um, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, and there's uh, industrial clouds are uh, definitely help in the collection and the analysis of this data. Um, and these clouds can be uh, private sort of on-premise clouds or third parties. Uh, software continues to be so important in the development process that teams are uh, looking for any way to get more code faster. Um, a lot of my clients and throughout my experience, uh, um, I saw that. Uh, there's a new emerging area called low code development. And it's an area that's growing very rapidly. And what it does is it uses this concept of uh, graphical interfaces to generate software apps um, instead of having to rely directly on going through and encoding directly. Java, C, et cetera, Python, R. Um, this can be helpful for getting off uh, some quick functionality, um, particularly if it's a non-critical coding, or if you have a team that maybe is not well-versed uh, in coding, this graphical interface um, allows you know, almost anyone um, to go in and develop uh, coding functionality. So when we, we look at the usage of a product, and what information can be obtained, it's sometimes convenient to sort of break it down into categories. And, you know, you have the description uh, followed by kind of the uh, diagnostic or analysis as to, um, you know, why it occurred, um, predicting. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, ultimately you want to get to what specific measures, right, can you uh, be taken to reduce either the occurrence of the issues or at least how to handle it when it happens. Uh, and finally, my last slide that I wanted to um, uh, conclude on is, you know, you've, uh, you've heard time is money. And, you know, a big premise uh, around time is money is that is this concept of shift left, right? And with shift left, you hear this in a lot of industries. Um, it talks about, you know, the sooner you can verify your product validate your manufacturing process the better because uh, the cost of change in investments are generally cheaper and easier in the product life cycle um, if they're done earlier than later so um, you know that i think is uh, certainly a key element of what uh, people in the auto industry um, are certainly after it's very expensive making changes later on and certainly it's very expensive if you think about um, if they have to recall vehicles for issues or problems. Um, so let me stop there and uh, open it up and see uh, what questions or comments people might have. Uh, thanks a lot, Frank, for your uh, amazing uh, presentation, like looking at all these things from this uh, perspective is, uh, is, is really important. And, uh, when I think uh, about it and from, let's say transportation, uh, point of view, there are a lot of questions that comes, uh, to my mind. So I want to. Uh, ask a few questions uh, that I kind of wrote in aside, and um, we can also have like give the floor for uh, 
our audience to uh, ask their questions. I'm sure like you will have a lot of them today. So uh, you mentioned that like, and we all think about it when we are taking into consideration the ITS or intelligent transportation systems, communication, automation, and that amount of, of data and the emerging 5G and you brought up the Wi Fi 6 in V2X communication technology. So we will have a huge amount of data that we will be able to utilize. And as you said, like the best utilization of the data is, is the, like the, the new thing now. So the, the data latency and like how do we deal with this data? Who's going to be responsible? Who will own this data? And like these all questions come to comes to mind and what kind of infrastructure do we really need to handle this uh, th this amount of data? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, and I will, I'll say right up front, I don't think uh, the industry has uh, come to a um, complete solution around that, right? Because, uh, you know, the data, as you mentioned, is gonna be huge amounts of data um, you have to deal with the privacy and security of that data. Um, there is some data that, uh, you know, might be necessary for accident avoidance versus, um, you know, certain amounts of data. I mean, you know, imagine if the data can be personalized. Now, all of a sudden, if someone had sort of bad intentions, they could identify individual users you know, in if this data is going to a common place and start to figure out where these people are going, et cetera, right? So you can think of a whole series of, of uh, ethical um, issues around, you know, who's going to own the data and, and, and what to do with the data. Um, on the technical side, a uh, couple of comments I'd make there around data. So first of all, you're right, 5G is, is going to be critical for this because one of the key things about 5G is uh, the latency uh, and the improvement in latency, which allows real-time control. So the, the spec, for example, on 5G has a, a latency of, um, it goes down to one millisecond, um, which is an order of magnitude improvement over 4G. So uh, uh, trying to use a 4G system for accident avoidance and autonomous vehicle won't work, right? So you need, you need that 5G system. By the way, there's a, uh, there's a great video uh, for you people that are um, soccer uh, fans where Ericsson, uh, go out on, the, um, on YouTube and Ericsson's got a great video uh, comparing 4G to 5G. And uh, they do it with some players from uh, PSG. Paris Saint-Germain uh, uh, soccer team, uh, them trying to, to use virtual headsets enabled by 4G versus 5G, and they're trying to dribble and score goals and, and all that stuff. So it, it kind of highlights that latency uh, um, part. Um, the other piece, and this could be related to what to, how to protect or what to do with the data, will be where do you store it and manipulate it? So there's a lot of discussion about how much um, compute power do you put in the vehicle itself and how much do you have to rely on, say, the cloud, if you will. So this whole uh, trade-off between cloud computing and edge computing is in the center of autonomous vehicle pieces. And so, you know, a lot of people say, uh, not only for privacy, but reliability, certain capabilities have to be at the edge in the vehicle itself. And maybe that's where um, your personal data somehow or profile gets stored. Um, and then the amount of data that you use sort of to interact might be anonymous, but simply used um, in terms of real time ability to you know, drive and whatnot. Um, but it gets further complicated too, because the transportation revolution um, you got this whole idea of shared mobility where uh, people may not be owning vehicles, right? So how does that uh, also get handled? And then uh, 
you know, one of the other areas uh, will be how will it interact, for example, with your smartphone? Because we have a tremendous amount of information on here. So I'm afraid I, I probably didn't answer your question and all I did was ask more questions to your question. <laughs> Uh, but it's a hugely uh, uh, important field, and it's things that we're grasp, trying to grasp with every day, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. I think uh, we have uh, also questions from my colleague here, uh, Nassim Bahir, so I will leave the, the floor to him. Thank you, Harith, and uh, thank you, Fram, for the very nice presentation. Uh, you touch on many dear topics to uh, engineers in the automotive industry. Uh, digital transformation is uh, is happening as we speak. Uh, I worked in the auto industry in the U.S. for eight years, so a lot of these things you talked about, you know, uh, I was involved in them. And when I, you know, came back to Lebanon at AUB, still active in the uh, automotive active safety uh, system control system design. And uh, now we're working on autonomous driving in uh, unstructured environments like Beirut. You can imagine how many challenges are there. <laughs> so uh, my uh, my question to you is, how do you, based on your experience, uh, long experience, it seems, I'm, I'm pretty impressed with the projects you've done. How do you foresee, if you had a crystal ball and you're looking into the future, there will be a lot of uh, autonomous vehicles at some point, a lot of non-smart vehicles. How do you see this interaction between these two breeds and when you have a driver and you add some, you know, uh, autonomy to the to the vehicle, do you see the two working together, the agent and the driver, or like in a in a complementary fashion, or do you see them working not in parallel in series? You know, when one is active, the other one has to be turned off, and then it will relinquish control back. So, do you see this as series or parallel? I'm not sure if my question is clear. Yeah, no, I I I got it. And so, first of all. Um... Nassim, hopefully I didn't provide you with any uh, nightmares of your eight years in the U.S. by going through some of these issues, because you probably were like, oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, those are the good old days, let me say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, thank you for being uh, very diplomatic of, about my many years of experience. Um, it must have not saying you're old. Know. Not saying you're old. I said it. <laughs> got it. Got it. Um, you know, I think I think there are actually some some models here that we can point to as to uh, the parallel nature of this autonomy, right? Uh, think about the automobile, uh, the uh, aerospace industry, right, and a plane. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, very early planes were completely manual, right? Uh, yeah. Increasingly, you look at planes today. And uh, the amount of interaction that a pilot does in a plane has, you know, significantly decreased. There's, you know, almost like automation to take off and land. And, and in fact, mm -hmm. uh, in a lot of cases, what they, what they find is that uh, in most cases, not all, but in most cases, right, the, the pilot error uh, uh, produces more error, right? The pilot produces more error than than the automation or the autonomous um, plane does, right? Mm -hmm. So it does definitely provide a safer environment. Now, the the problem, and and this will be something we'll have to work through early on, and we still work through it now. Is it's usually that is the case, but every once in a while, right, you, you do have a failure related to autonomous vehicle. It doesn't stop, right? We had someone who died here in, in Arizona not too long ago, mm -hmm. and it got traced back to some code that was bad. Um, and it becomes a hugely sort of public thing, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas every day in the U.S., as you probably know, uh, uh, driver error is, you know, killing hundreds, if not thousands of people, right? But you have this mm -hmm. one where if the code doesn't, so that's one thing we're going to have to have to work through. But to kind of answer your question, I mean, I, I, we've been going through this gradually, right? You know, things like uh, anti-lock brakes, and I just bought a new vehicle uh, a couple of weeks ago. And it has these things like uh, uh, lane, if you veer off from your lane, right? Uh -huh. direction. Uh -huh. It's all these sort of various things. And uh, 
at, when these things sort of get introduced in gradually, um, but the driver is sort of still there and, uh, you know, in command, um, I, I see that as being sort of a positive thing. I think we're, we're a ways off from what I'll call mass deployment of just getting into a vehicle, sitting back and, uh, you know, letting the vehicle sort of do, do its thing. You know, you'll see it in airports or, you know, some limited cases where you can control sort of the driving mm -hmm. experience, but mm -hmm. uh, it would be, uh, it would be a very interesting implementation to put autonomous vehicles in Beirut. I, I, I would really like to yeah. see, <laughs> see that implementation. On one hand, it's a very crazy scenario. Yet on the other hand, I think it actually could have some very positive effects if if this craziness was, you know, completely controlled by um, sort of logical software means. <laughs> yeah, you can imagine the technical challenges we're facing. My, just a small follow up, if you allow me. Yeah. I'm working yeah. with Maya, with Maya actually on a research uh, project, and that's, you know, the the motivation behind my question is, uh, you know, this uh, interaction between the autonomous agent and the human driver. Uh, just to uh, follow up, do you f see yeah. that the two will be working together, and one will be giving control to the other one, uh, or you see them that one when one is active, the other one has to be turned off. That's kind of just to clarify this. How do you yeah, foresee I mean, this? In, in its most advanced forms, I see them interacting together, mm -hmm. right? But the problem is sort of getting there. And it's kind of like, um, you know, the difference between, say, augmented reality and uh, extended reality, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, augmented reality is is great in that you know digital objects right can be placed on top of say um what's happening in real life but you can't really manipulate the digital objects in extended reality right you can actually change the digital objects and how they interact with it so i that's kind of my crystal ball i i foresee that uh as being um you know the ultimate goal but uh if nothing else in the uh, automotive industry, and you probably saw this as well, it's very difficult to do revolutionary things there. It has to be very right. sort of small yep. steps evolution. But okay. you know, from a research perspective in particular, you know, I, I always kind of view the, the universities and the research folks as you need to be focused on like the far ultimate uh, goals. Right. Right? right, exactly. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Nassim. Thanks a lot, Trum. Um, one of the things that we also here try to do uh, at AUB, uh, we have a driver uh, simulator. So one of the things that we're working on uh, lately, like the interaction of, uh, or let's say the driver's compliance with uh, in-vehicle routing system or intelligent routing system and give them that kind of uh, feeling of having different or conflicting uh, information. So the information that you receive from Google and like in vehicle smart system that will give them different routing information due to I think we may did we lose? Howdy? Yeah, it seems we did because uh, I thought it was from my end. I think he was starting to ask a question maybe around um, data from various sources. And maybe I'll, I'll predict he was going to ask something. I'll use my AI techniques about how do you um, prioritize the uh, the sources of data, or how do you reconcile across, um, you know, sort of different uh, data sources? Um, and it's a it's a great question, and I know it's something that's uh, being uh, discussed, particularly within the context of uh, smart cities and infrastructure in smart cities. Um, and I think that a, a, a lot of a lot of smart city development um, 
you know, they, they want to have uh, some ability for folks to um, uh, control their own destiny, if you will, and, and have choice. But they also want to have an ability, for example, if there is a, uh, I'll call it an emergency or an event or something where, you know, uh, a government or a city can uh, sort of implement uh, emergency procedures, if you will, uh, if necessary. But uh, the the concept of choice on uh, on data and and how to um, optimize, I think, is an important thing, and it's an important thing that people want to continue to keep. Um, but there also has to be what I call the regulatory environment that says for uh, certain safety critical items like accident avoidance, emergencies, et cetera, there has to be a certain conformance or regulatory with respect to the data. But then there's things that are sort of non-critical, which might be things like um, uh, routing or um, what route I'm gonna take from point A to point B, where uh, you know some choice of programmability uh, might be possible. I don't know if Harith was able to dial back in. Maybe not. Um, are there any other questions uh, from folks? Hello. Um, here's uh, Noor Aie, your fellow bear from Fadibian. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hello, Sahla Fik. Uh, so I don't know, like just an idea came to my mind and I was wondering like uh, from the driver's perspective or the consumers, uh, how would the experience be? I mean, what driving test would, would it be required to have? Like, I mean, it's definitely different and you know, some people do really enjoy driving actually. So would they be upset or more happy with these new vehicles? Uh, you know, uh, it's a great, it's a great question. Um, you, you're going to have, um, uh, again, variety of people, even based on generational uh, uh, things, where um, uh, it's going to change. So, you know, first of all, like on autonomous vehicles, I suspect that uh, a lot of the places where the infrastructure is going to be set up first will be uh, within cities. And uh, and if you look within big cities, uh, a lot of people, including young people, uh, don't see uh, vehicle ownership, if you will, as being something that either they can afford or they need. Um, a lot of them in big cities rely on public transportation anyway. Um, and then to the extent where they, they need something that's more personal, you have these models like Uber and Lyft. Um, uh, there's even a company called Turo. I don't know if folks are familiar with Turo. The, the co-founder of Turo is actually Lebanese, Andre Haddad, but he's taking sort of the Airbnb model uh, and applying it to vehicles. So what you can do is you can actually rent out your own personal vehicle to folks that need a sort of a short-term rental. So, um, so there is that dynamic that's already happening, I would say within, within cities um, where car ownership, uh, and if you look at it, car ownership has actually you know, been declining. Now, having said that, outside of the major cities, at least for some time, I suspect the infrastructure won't be in place for autonomous vehicle driving, or it won't be as um, advanced. So there will be still uh, opportunities uh, to, you know, for people to enjoy uh, sort of that driving uh, experience. Um, and I suspect there will still be opportunities for folks to, um, you know, either through rental or like these share mobility models where, you know, they can, um, they can still get that uh, experience. But clearly, automobiles, just like technology, everything in general, there's a huge generational shift. And, um, you know, they, like I said, there, you see big shift going from 
uh, I'll say people my dad's age <laughs> to people my age to you know people in their in their 20s uh, and and my kids' age. Um, and the whole vehicle thing is is kind of viewed very differently. Um, and I think it'll have certainly will have an impact, obviously, on the on like you mentioned licenses and what kind of license you get. My experience with licenses and some of the regulatory things is that tends to happen last. Technology tends to move much faster than than governments can in terms of adopting to the regulatory um, and licensing environment. Did I answer your question, Noor? Thank you very much. It was very interesting to watch your talk as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, special, uh, special thank you for uh, Nesmin Fadibian. Thank you. <laughs> How did this we lost you there for a bit. Yeah, I, I noticed. Uh, I told Maya. Uh, I I noticed I'm, that I'm talking to myself. I thought like I like you lost connection because it showed like you don't have the proper connection. Then after a while, I noticed like I'm talking to myself. I think the uh, Wi-Fi connection here couldn't handle that much of data. You know, like being uh, communicated. Uh, you know, <laughs> well, throughout the continent. So it got disconnected. I think that could be a, um, uh, you know, that's, I hate to tell you this, but that's a sign you're getting older if you start talking to yourself a lot. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I know, I know that. No, I, I haven't reached at that point yet. But no, maybe, no, no, no. Yeah, like if, if we, you know, uh, kept being under such kind of stress here, like in, in, in Lebanon, we might see that coming soon, you know. Well, inshallah khayat. And inshallah, yeah, hopefully. <laughs> we hope for that. So, we uh, pray for that. Let's see if there's any other questions from. Uh, I, I have from, one question. Yeah. Thank you for your interesting talk, Fram. Uh, I'm interested to know your take on uh, new technologies that can be put in the car to detect the driver's emotional state or their level of tension in the future. Um, you know, through eye tracking or through sensors that detect physiology, uh, sweat, etc. Conveying back this information to the driver. I mean, are these things that drivers would like to have in the car? What is their future with respect to auto manufacturers take on them? So you, um, you, you said a very key term in, in that question, which was conveying it back to the driver, right? Because yeah. ob obviously, uh, the the first concern that people would have would be uh, who's going to access this information. So if it's simply going back to the driver, and there'll be a bit of a trust issue there, right? Because some people will say, well, how do I know it's only coming back to me? Uh, um, again, I I I think there will be a certain uh, population that will. Um, embrace items of that of that type, right? Um, but there's obviously the huge concern around privacy, um, how the data is going to be used, and if the technology exists, would they, for example, mandate it? So, if someone, for example, uh, got into a lot of accidents or whatnot, could a court say? <laughs> Uh, the only way we're going to let you drive in the future is if you have this kind of system enabled on your vehicle, right? Uh, that gets into kind of some very dicey situations. But you know what's interesting on that type of software uh, related to that, uh, and I don't know if AUB has used some of this, but you know my daughter uh, is a junior um, in college. She spent the last year here in the pandemic. Uh, home with us, and uh, she had to, as part of taking exams and whatnot, she had to install software that kind of did some similar things, tracked eye movement, et cetera, scanned the room, kind of all these things to ensure that, uh, you know, essentially people aren't cheating uh, when they're home uh, uh, taking exams. And so these have been sort of widely uh, adapted in the in the educational uh, environment in response to the pandemic. And 
and uh, kind of mixed results. Uh, a lot of the students, uh, including my daughter, didn't exactly enjoy it. Um, but, um, you know, you could see that same sort of application kind of going over uh, into the space. And again, on a lot of these uh, kinds of controversial items, I think where it gets uh, tough is when you try to move from the uh, making it available as a choice to the user to when it starts to go into the what I call the realm of uh, regulatory or mandatory or or people start acting, asking for the uh, access to that data. And that's where it becomes um, sort of much more challenging. And and I think it can even vary by country, because as you know, the regulatory environment and even how um, people treat data varies widely across country boundaries, right? Um, to, you know, people who are countries that are, are much more willing to say, this data needs to be in there, it's the only way we can ensure the common good and uh, the, uh, uh, the safety. Uh, factor where you swing to the other side where you have countries that are much more what I call individualistic, uh, which is your data is your data. No one has the right to it, um, uh, even if it could help sort of the common good. Thank you, Frank. Yeah, thank you, Maya. By the way, Maya, my daughter's name is Maya. <laughs> <laughs> So I believe uh, we have Noor here. Uh, she has uh, her hands up or? Yeah, uh, she just put it down. She asked her question, okay. but given that she's uh, from Cloud to BN, she gets unlimited questions if she likes. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, I see. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have one question that I've been asked, I remember like a few years ago, uh, during my uh, PhD defense and talking about like the autonomous and connected vehicles, one of the questions that I got was like, who will hold the liability if any kind of accidents happen, especially like in the future, there will be like multiple players in the market and like multiple stakeholders, starting from the automotive uh, car manufacturer, like automotive man manufacturers and going, moving forward, like to the private uh, sorry, the public sector and uh, telecommunication companies. And so like, who will hold the liability if any sort of accidents happen? Yeah, um, I can tell you one group that'll be also very interested in that question, which will be the insurance companies. Because based on who has the liability, right? It will determine, um, how the insurance companies are willing to sort of, you know, step up and protect and at what rate. I mean, you, you already see sort of an involvement on this. I, I, I don't know if they have this in Lebanon, but here in the US, you can buy car insurance. In fact, most uh, states require that you have car insurance, but you can also, and this kind of gets to Maya's point earlier, it's, it's voluntary right now but you can put a little device in your car that transmits your driving habits to the insurance company. It measures things like braking, um, how fast you take turns, do you do rapid acceleration, et cetera. And based on that data, they can do uh, various uh, uh, pricing models. Yeah, discount to, rates kind of. Discount rates and, and uh, even, uh, I suppose they can discount. I don't. Maybe they can also raise your rates as well, right? Yeah. So, uh, I, I think, I think you 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 may start to see sort of those kinds of. It's like if I were an insurance company, where right, we just had this discussion about data, and data, you know, I would probably say something like, okay, I'm willing to ensure the parties that you will if I and more data I have access to, including the the record and data of how this vehicle is performing, the driver's performance, 
if some of that software, for example, that Maya mentioned that detects the state of the driver uh, is made accessible to me, then I can provide a certain a rate here. And as you know, that rate is as, as I get less and less access to data, obviously my rate has to go down. And it, that is really independent of whoever is assuming the liability. Because at the end of the day, they're all going to go back to the same basically insurance program, right? <laughs> to, to, get, to get their coverage. So, um, so that's going to be, I think, an interesting, interesting thing to watch. Um, uh, that's kind of, you know, uh, and I think it's potentially as people uh, uh, get maybe more and more comfortable with what the, the kind of data they collect and they weigh that, it'll be an individual choice in the beginning. Right? They'll weigh it against, am I, we all do this every day. Am I willing to give up a certain amount of my privacy in exchange for some value, or lower rates, or some some convenience? Right. We do this every day. Trying to click on and we're using something for free, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. Means we just signed away some level of your data and privacy in exchange for not wanting to pay something. Yeah, you're totally right. I totally agree. And following up on Maya's question, like one of the things that the smart watches that they, for example, the Apple Watch, they take your heart rate, they take your uh, oxygen level and these things and they have the liberty, like it takes the liberty to, to call an ambulance overnight or, or something if they want to stop something uh, abnormal in, in the heart rate or oxygen level and these things. So that's part of the uh, data used by companies and for such kind of applications, people are willing to give up their data to, to the companies to save their lives somehow. But there could be something similar, or it will be similar soon for uh, autonomous vehicles and that kind of part of connectivity in, in the next uh, few years. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I agree. Other uh, questions from the group? Excellent. So we have. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Hey, Professor. Yes. Um. Good morning here. Okay. Good, good morning. Uh, nice. Nice to hear you talk, and uh, it's amazing. Uh, it's great to hear that. Um. I got a question, but this is like uh, probably uh. Uh. Just minor question in terms of this topic. How about the um, uh, the authority in terms of uh, um, those uh, watching? Now we we have here in states like uh, uh, watching for the speeding of the vehicles. What do you think of those kind of uh, interaction with our autonomous mo uh, vehicles? Would there be lesser uh, watch on the road? Because I'm assuming that there will be. Uh, automated control of the speeds of the car or the uh, vehicles or uh, would that be uh, also uh, be included in the infrastructure of uh, automation or autonomous uh, system sure yeah <clears throat> and uh, thank you thank you Riz, for um, for that again by the way Riz uh, is actually in my digital transformation class that I'm teaching at Clarkson University. I, uh, I made them aware of this talk. And uh, so thank you, Riz. And, and in fact, in our class, as Riz knows, uh, in our next lecture, we, uh, we're actually focusing on the automotive industry. So uh, uh, you got a little bit of a precursor today, yes. Riz. On yes. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, um, you you already see, by the way, a lot of automation going into enforcement today, right? So, uh, personal experience, I visited uh, Switzerland uh, two years ago, and um, I got back home, 
And my wife and I rented a car. We drove all over Switzerland, uh, got back home and I found a uh, nice little uh, ticket um, uh, in my mail from, um, uh, I was uh, 10 kilometers over the speed limit um, exiting uh, Geneva. And, uh, you know, there was no, Acknowledgement, et cetera, at the time. The only thing was when I got back here, um, you know, I had this uh, uh, very expensive uh, for 10 kilometers over uh, and ended up costing 250 euro, which uh, was shocking to me. But um, so, so you already sort of see this and you probably will see it for some time because uh, of the point that I think Noor and some of the others mentioned you're going to have a combination of vehicles that are on the road. And so as long as there's that combination, there still needs to be a, a level of enforcement. Um, now, certainly on the autonomous vehicle where, you know, speed is controlled, et cetera. Um, I think, and remember the regulatory environment, right? Governments and whatnot are gonna be the last to react Right, because there's a lot of implications, uh, and they're the, typically the slowest to, to react anyway. So, there, for example, may not be trustworthy of just how the speed gets controlled. So, they're going to say we need to have some sort of check. So, that's why we still need to have some enforcement capability. There's still going to be a lot of uh, manually driven, you know, cars. Um, so we need to have the enforcement capability uh, for them. Um, there could be something that goes wrong, even in the autonomous vehicle. So this gets to the, the emergency situation, et cetera, where uh, they not only have to be able to monitor these vehicles, but in the case of a declared emergency, a lot of cities, you know, talk about what role do we have to you know, fundamentally be able to control things. For example, um, not permitting or allowing vehicles, say, into a certain area that's going through a disaster or something, right? So you couldn't drive in. So, you know, a lot of this might be replaced uh, over time. You might see the enforcement element uh, or, uh, being replaced by, um, Again, the control element of of saying, uh, you know, in emergencies we need to do certain things, or we need to keep people out of certain areas, or we need to redirect if there's an accident, right? To to allow, you know, um, uh, ensure congestion doesn't happen, or limit flow of traffic, or there's sort of all these things, right, that um, become more on the optimization side versus today where it's mostly on the enforcement side. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, we'll see yeah, you and, uh, on Tuesday. Yeah, see you. And I would like to thank for the uh, host for having me here and to the whole class. Nice meeting you all. Where's we got to take you down to uh, Ireland today? <laughs> I would love that. <laughs> like we say, Ahla Sahla Fi. Welcome. Oh, I need to learn that. Well, I'll teach you everything you need to know. I'm proud of the few things that you should know. <laughs> All right. So, uh, one last question from my side. Uh, I asked a lot today, but in terms of the communication, what comes to my mind and part of our research here is dealing with infrastructureless vehicle, like let's say car to X, uh, like vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to pedestrian uh, communication. And in the near, like when do you see that uh, thing coming? Like, is it like a near future thing or because now most of the like the vehicles, they rely on different uh, communication protocol than the one that is being used by cell phones, let's say, or 
as we call it, the, like the vulnerable road user. So when do you see that uh, thing coming? Yeah, I, uh, I see it coming sooner rather than later. Um, <clears throat> I should say that uh, in addition to Siemens being one of my clients, um, I work at Qualcomm and specifically um, I work with the automotive team at Qualcomm on uh, 5G and cellular Vita X implementation. So, um, so uh, what I can, I guess, say publicly there, right, is uh, people are, um, they're, they're looking at cellular technology in the vehicle going from, you know, the initial implementations were, were around things like, if you remember OnStar, right, which was this technology where um, if you got in an accident or you could see directions, you push the button and you could talk to someone. It was basically just a cell phone. Yeah, and, the, the GM thing. Right? Yeah, exactly. And, um, and in general, uh, you know, it moved into the telematics range where, again, sort of using the standard, as you point out, cellular connectivity uh, piece, um, it uh, allows you to do, you know, monitor the engine, sort of do all these sorts of things or, or infotainment, right? Which is being able to download music, whatever, maps, uh, to moving into this realm of uh, true C to uh, V to X, which that protocol specifically, right, as you point out, is not just about the cellular piece, but also doing peer-to-peer um, -peer communications, right? And so, uh, you know, I can say just about every auto uh, company is is looking at that. Um, they're uh, probably more than looking at it, right? They're they're designing um, that. Um, I see it coming out, um, uh, you know, definitely in the next uh, three to five years. There will be instantiations of that. Um, like anything which is a new communication protocol, right? You got to have the systems and devices there that will be able to uh, support the peer to peer communication. So um, I think you'll see uh, smart cities like Singapore, um, Barcelona is another one that's been very sort of active in terms of smart city development, even here in San Diego. So I think in conjunction with the vehicle folks sort of implementing that, the infrastructure folks from a smart cities perspective, uh, providing the environment for that, because even though it's a peer-to-peer -peer communication, you still want to try to get some sort of the broader smart city infrastructure. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, I, I, I think you'll start to see this kind of being more prevalent in the next three to five years. And, uh, you know, I think it's got, it's got great promise. It's got great promise. And, you know, Chuck, we can have it for Chuck, hopefully. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for, for your answers. Appreciate it. And I noticed there was a... a a chat here um, from Nassim. I know he had to drop, um, but um, he said on the uh, next visit to Lebanon, inshallah, I'd love to show you around the capabilities and infrastructure that we have at AUB, and I would love that. Um, I was uh, hoping last summer, uh, my last trip to Lebanon was in 2019. Uh, obviously, I did not get down there last year. Uh, this year might be tough as well. Uh, given the situation, uh, but I'm hopeful as soon as possible, and hopefully uh, 2022, I guess, uh, to be able to not only come down, but maybe uh, spend some extended time down there. Inshallah, hopefully we'll see you on campus. That would be great. Great. Uh, I maybe. guess uh, our time is up for the official event so i don't know and does anybody have any more questions okay. 
if not. Thank you so much for such an interesting talk. I don't Thank know you, if Dr. Harith wants to add something as well, and Dr. Maya. Um, so thanks a lot. I have nothing to add. Like uh, it was an, an amazing uh, event, to be honest. And, uh, I really, really appreciate uh, like dedicating and allocating uh, your time for give, like giving such kind of like amazing talk. Appreciate it, and it's like uh, my pleasure to uh, to to know you and uh, hope. Inshallah, I look forward to it. Yeah, and I want to add that like this is not the first time that uh, Mr. Frem has uh, given us uh, such an exciting talk. Uh, we had also a talk back in uh, I think in March or in February, twenty twenty. April which was about five G. Ah, in April. April, yeah. April, April twenty eighth, and the reason I remember the dean it was uh, it was my birthday. Ah, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So yeah, I will be looking forward for more talks for sure. <laughs> that sounds great. Oh, Nadine, ma shabne ki shiriyam. Yeah, that's because um, I was I'm driving home. Ah, okay. So I couldn't. Yeah, I couldn't. Tune in said, and you video. don't have an autonomous vehicle yet, so we want you focused. No, not forward. yet. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Fran, for the exciting talk. Thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. Stay safe and stay stay well. Marcel, I'm safe for you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. Bye bye. bye.